I know it can be uncomfortable singing new hymns, but if you were to ponder those words as you were to leave, you could not help but live differently. Now, the only danger in singing that hymn before you preach is that you are uh, already going to be struggling. It is marvelous. Um, That final phrase, that I am embraced and welcomed home, knowing the sinner that I am. So in light of that, may we listen and obey and glory in God's grace to us in Christ. I would like to say, uh, I didn't get this to Josh in time, um, but um, before I get started, before I forget, uh, Amy and Jeff Crittenbrink are um, pretty sick. Amy's actually getting better. Uh, She's pretty good. She said about 80, 85%. But Jeff has relapsed, and in fact, he's uh, not doing very well at all. And so if you could pray for him, um, not not to the point of going to the hospital or anything, but he's sick and uh, feels very, very lousy. So if we could lift him and his family up, they just had it pretty rough. It is good to see you, those that are here. And if you are watching on the live stream, please reach out if there's anything that we can do. Um, I would love to even know just where you live so I can come bring you something to eat maybe. So it would do my heart good. It would do the heart good of those in this congregation if you, if you reached out. So please don't hesitate. Our text this morning is going to be in the book of Ephesians again. We're carrying on in our study of this book, and we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5. Our text is Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, but I want to read verses 30 through verses um, 1 and 2 of chapter 5. So we're going to start in verse 30 of chapter 4 so we can get context. If you have a pew Bible, that's uh, on page 978, the Bible underneath your chair, We don't have pews, but if you don't have a Bible, uh, we would invite you to take that home with you as a gift from those of us at Crossroad. If you don't own a Bible, please do that. So Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 30, would you please stand with me as we stand in honor of the reading of God's word? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That is God's word. Let us pray. Father, you are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with you while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice your truth. But if we walk in the light as you are in the light, We have fellowship with you and fellowship with one another. God, do that now. That's why we're here this morning. Illuminate our hearts and minds to see the beauty in your word. That now through your spirit we could worship you rightly in truth. To your glory and our good now we ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There are very few things that I find more joy in. There are things that I find more joy in, Christ. But there are very few things I find more joy in than when I see that my daughter wants to be with me, wants to do the things that, she, that, that I do. I mean, or when I see my daughter want to do the things that Carissa does. Just take, for instance, just the other night, we're finishing up family devotion time, and We say amen, and Abigail, without being prompted, we've never told her to do this, she goes over and grabs her little toy broom, 
and start sweeping underneath the table. She has seen mommy and daddy do that a number of times, mostly mommy. <laughs> and she wants to be like her mother. Or the way that she takes a doll, and just recently you see her burping the doll. And who, I never taught, we never taught you to burp a doll. And yet she sees her mother and her father do that, and she wants to do that. Or, it was so fun, just a couple days ago, uh, I told her, hey, Abigail, you can play with toys while I go out into the garage and work on something. And she says, no, I want to go with you. I want to be with you. Man, there's not much thing better than that to hear that. And then for me to see her follow me in, and she's fake screwing screws into something because she wants to be like Daddy. She wants to be like Mommy and Daddy. And our passage this morning provides us with that same basic idea. In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5, we are told to imitate God because if you name the name of Christ, you are his child. And you imitate him by walking in love. Just as a child, says Abigail, or one of your children, looks at someone, admires what they see, and wants to do what they see, it's natural for children to imitate those they are looking at. And so in our passage to today, you and I are to walk with God. We're to look at him, meditate upon him, and imitate him. And as we imitate him, we're going to find out that we're to imitate him in love. To walk with God is to walk in love. If you want to sum up Ephesians chapter 5, 1 and 2, that, there, there it is. Walk with God by walking in love. So that's our sermon outline this morning. Very simple. Two commands. Command number one from Holy Scripture. Walk with God. Study Him. Imitate Him. And command number two. Walk in love. And when you put those together, we find that indeed walking with God is walking in love. Let me just show you that briefly so you can see that from the text itself. Just based on sentence structure alone, look there in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Then verse 2, same sentence structure. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Same sentence structure, same type of wording going on here, same type of simile, if you would. And Paul is describing what it means practically, particularly, to imitate God. So that's our main idea. Walk with God, walk in love. So number one, what does it mean to walk with God? What does it mean to imitate Him? I want you to notice a word in verse 1 there. So it says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Notice it does not say, be imitators of God as children. That would be absolutely appropriate. But instead of that, it says, beloved children. And I just wonder how often we read texts like this and we skip over an unbelievably, I mean nearly unbelievably, wonderful reality. Beloved. Catch that. In the original language, it would carry the meaning of precious, special, cherished, the object of God's affections, beloved. I mean, you just get the wildness of that word, God calling you his beloved child in Christ. God calling you an object of his affections. God calling you a child who is cherished, dear, special to him. And he's doing that in the midst of knowing everything about you. You think about that, knowing all of your sin, past, present, future, knowing how verse 31 in chapter 4 was true for you before Christ, how bitterness and wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice, how they were your friends, and how you still, how you still wrestle with them, how the meditations of your heart were wicked. How you used to insist upon your own self-righteousness instead of the righteousness of Christ. How you used to love falsehood and the truth, the truth about God, the truth about His holiness, the truth about who you are in your sinfulness. 
And God knew all of this. God, in his omniscience, being all-knowing, because he's God, he knows it, in eternity past, before you were even born, before you, your parents were born, before the foundations of the world were laid, God declared this child, this son, this daughter will be in my family. I will secure for them at the price of my son's life that they will be mine forever. Now, I'm not making that up. I mean, where do I get that? Look with me briefly. Ephesians, go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Where do I get that? I get that right out of Ephesians chapter 1. If you look with me there in verses 3 through 6. Verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through jesus christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved beloved you are beloved if you belong to christ hear this god the father loves you with a love that sent his son to die for you God the Son loves you with a love demonstrated by the fact that He gave His life for you freely at the cross to make you a child of God. And God the Holy Spirit loves you in a way to effect that work in you by saving you and making you a beloved child of God. So much so. That if you have trusted in Jesus, and if you have not trusted in Jesus, this is not true for you. But if you've trusted in Jesus, the very words of God at the baptism of Jesus are true for you. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. When God the Father said from heaven, you are my beloved son, beloved son, with you I am well pleased. That is true for those who have been saved by grace through faith. God says to you, you are my beloved son. Or daughter. And with you I am well pleased. We need to hear that. I have had so many conversations. Just in this body. Just in this body. With people that need to hear. That they're, God is pleased with them in Christ. That if you are in Christ. Wrapped in his garments of salvation. As we talked about last week. God sees you and he doesn't see your filth. He doesn't see your sin anymore. He sees his own son. And he declares you his own child. He declares that. How are you going to go against the declaration of God? That's the same words that spoke the world into existence. And he declares you to be his child. And not just a child. Beloved child. And he loves you and you are precious to him. And so, and so for those who know their sin and their failures and their wickedness, both before conversion and even now, as they wrestle with the flesh and sit in their lives, they marvel at this, that Christ, that God would take my sin upon himself. Yes, they marvel. They marvel that Christ would switch places with them at the cross. But even more, they marvel that God the Father would welcome you as his child. Hear that, believe that. He knew me, all of my fickleness, all my failures, and before I was even in the womb, knowing all of that wickedness about me, declared, you're mine. And so the Christian, how can he not do anything but just sing that wonderful hymn? How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. 1 John 3, 1 says as much. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called sons of God. We should be called children of God. And we are. 
Let's get back to our passage. If you look again at Ephesians 4, I want to just explore this idea just a little bit more with you about being a beloved child of God. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So I'm just trying to put together this reality with you that you are a beloved child of God. So piece this together. See the Trinity here at work. God the Father adopts you into his family through the death and resurrection of God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit comes and seals you in. Or you could say, God the Holy Spirit gives you a stamp of approval, of authenticity, that you are indeed God's chosen child. The Trinity does that. If you don't have the Trinity, you don't have any of that. Without the Trinity, without the adoption of God the Father, the work of Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of new life and the work of the Holy Spirit to come and take up residence and make it permanent that you're a child of God. If there's no Trinity, you got no hope of being a child of God. Not a sliver of hope that you can be called the beloved child of God. I mean, we, just, we can hear that in Galatians chapter 4. Paul writes, but when the fullness of time had come, God the Father sent forth his son, born of a woman under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that they might receive adoption as sons and daughters. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I'm trying to show you the wonder that in the Trinity, God has called you a beloved child. The Holy Spirit provides an inward assurance that you belong to God. And the Holy Spirit provides an outward proof to the body of Christ, to one another here, that your faith is genuine, that you truly are a child of God. So that's what a seal is. A stamp of authenticity, security, ownership. The Holy Spirit given to you is proof that you belong to God forever. I just need to say this. Once sealed, always sealed. That's verse 30. Sealed for the day of redemption. Or to put it another way, sealed until the end. If you have ever belonged to God, you will always belong to God. God is a good father. He's the best father. He never loses one of his children. Ever. He will lose none of those that he calls beloved. All of God's children, all of God's saints persevere to the end. The Holy Spirit makes a mark on the believer, and it's not a water-based mark. It's not even an oil-based mark. It's a God, immutable, permanent mark. It's permanent-based, and that's what it means to be a beloved child of God. My brother uh, was a student at Missouri State University. It's in Springfield, Missouri. That's where I used to live, but, but when I was in college, I didn't live there. So I would go and visit Greg in Springfield, Missouri. And uh, whenever I got a chance uh, to get away from my studies at Rolla, I would go do that. And so when I would go to Springfield, Missouri, before I got married, you know, I didn't know anybody in Springfield besides Greg, I'd go into a coffee shop or go into a, a dormitory room, some kind of communal area, and people would be nice to me. But I was just Grant, you know. Just, it was that five foot something guy. And they were nice. But what was interesting was that uh, when Greg came in the door with me, or even if I just said, hey, I'm Greg Brown's brother, everything changed. Everything changed. Greg. Just the idea that I belonged with Greg. Or if Greg came in and said, hey, let me introduce my brother Grant to you. It was like the, the, the best thing in the world. Everybody was thinking I was somebody because I was with somebody, right? It made all the difference. I was welcomed because I belonged to Greg. 
he had a nickname. His name was Gravy Greg. <laughs> and uh, I was Gravy Greg's brother. In an even greater way, this is what it is like to know Christ. Just think about that. When you possess the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, everything changes. You're no longer the old you, you're the new creation, and you're welcomed. You're welcomed. There's a celebration. You're welcomed into the presence of God the Father. No longer his enemy, no longer someone unknown, but his friend. And even more, I will say it again, his very own beloved child. So I say all that to say, as a result of being his child, just as normal earthly children imitate their father, their mother, as God's children, we are to imitate our father in heaven. If you've repented of your sins and have put your faith in Jesus, you are a loved, cared for, precious child of God. And so as a child of God, you are to look to God. Study Him. You meditate on Him. You learn about who He is and what He's done. And then you say in your heart, Boy, I want to be like Him. I want to imitate Him. I want to follow Him as my model. I want to walk with Him and therefore walk like Him. I want to be like Christ. Paul makes no distinction here between imitating God and imitating Christ. To imitate Christ is to imitate God. Christ is God. So the child of God wants to walk with God. Wants to imitate Jesus. So that's what we're called to do. Imitate Christ. Now this might be hard, but I want to give a word of caution here. I have to because the text demands it. Please hear me. You are not, nor ever will be, God. We are to imitate him, but we are not to be him. There is a movement called the Word of Faith movement, and it's part of the larger prosperity gospel movement, and it's not of Christ. It's not of Christ. You see, the Word of Faith movement teaches you that you, as a child of God, are therefore a little God, and you declare things into existence by your own declarative words of faith. That's why it's called the Word of Faith movement. You, you declare reality. You name it, you claim it. God used words in Genesis 1 to create reality. So you too... As a little child of God, the Word of Faith movement teaches, should be able to do the same. You create truth, you create new reality in your life. If you have enough faith, you can, with words, cease from being sick. With words, with faith, you can cease from afflictions and poverty. And if you're suffering, the Word of Faith movement will tell you, if you're suffering or not prosperous in some manner, it's because you lack faith. Because if you believed enough as a little God yourself, because you speak truth into existence, that wouldn't happen. You speak with your words physical and material blessings in your life. So if you don't have health or wealth, if you don't have health or wealth, this movement says it's because you haven't exercised your power of God to make God bend to your will. You can do that because you're a little God. That's where the theology leads if you follow that line of thinking. I'm a little God. That is so not Christ. I'm here to tell you this morning that, that this is, that's a heretical and dangerous teaching. And I, and I love you, friends. I, I don't, that, that could be in this congregation. I'm very aware that after this, you could want to have a conversation with me. But do not believe this movement that's propagated by People like Benny Hinn and Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes, Paula White, Joyce Meyer, Kenneth Copeland, so many false teachers. It's heretical. And it will lead you away from Jesus. Scripture tells us that one of the ways you know that you're loved by God, one of the ways you know you're His child, is that He disciplines you. And discipline isn't pleasant, but it's from God. 
Scripture tells it's just from God. It's right. It's got no place in the Word of Faith movement. But children of God be, are disciplined because He loves us. One of the ways to know that you belong to Jesus, that you belong to God as His child, is that you suffer in the same way that Christ suffered. That if you suffer as a Christian for righteousness sake, God tells us it's evidence of the blessing of God. Suffering is the evidence of the blessing of God. That's throughout the New Testament. It's not because you lack faith. It's not because you aren't speaking the right words. Jesus himself was the fulfillment of the prophecy concerning suffering. The exact opposite of health and wealth. Isaiah 53.3, Jesus himself, God himself, was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So when you follow Jesus, you aren't surprised by affliction. Oh, I know it hurts, and it doesn't make sense, and it grieves you. When pain comes, it feels horrible when you lose somebody. When sickness arrives at your front door, and yet you know Romans 8, 28, you know the sovereignty of God and His promise to work all things for His glory and your good. And you're helped by it. Only the Christian can be helped by affliction. This is so anti-worldly right now, what I'm talking about. Only the Christian can look at the affliction and the pain in the loss and say, I'm held by God. Like a child, I run to Him. I'm helped. I, I desire God more than when I was in health and wealth. He uses that for your good. When you grow and mature and find a strange delight and satisfaction in ways you couldn't, in worldly health and wealth. So the Word of Faith movement could not be more wrong, friends, when it comes to understanding who you are as a child of God. And if that is something you've given yourself to, it's something you've toyed around with, it's all right. But hear this now. Hear the truth. If you've been captured by this way of thinking, hear this We are to imitate God. And how did God show his love? How did God show us to imitate this? How did God show his love towards us? He endured affliction. He endured suffering and even death. Look at verse 2 of our passage this morning. Ephesians 5 verse 2. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, was a sacrifice, right? He gave himself up for us. It's not earthly prosperity or wealth. It's the exact opposite. So if that is what God did and that is what God experienced, dare we insist that we should know nothing of this? Dare we insist as God's children that God wishes us not to imitate him in his own suffering? Dare we insist that the Christian life has no suffering in it? The Christian life is not all about suffering. Yes, that's so true. It's not all about suffering. Not even close. But the Christian life does include suffering. And it's right here in our text, friends. As our example. So I ask you, and this is a touchy subject for some people, let God's word inform your theology. Let go of the idea that it's because of weak faith that affliction is in your life. God gets the glory when we trust in him in the midst of loss, in the midst of pain, in the midst of affliction, more than he gets the glory when we trust him in wealth and health. I'm not saying that wealth and health are bad. I'm not saying that for a moment. But that's not the way we are called to imitate our Savior Jesus in this passage this morning. So watch out for the word of faith movement. It will lead you into idolatry and ruin because it will lead you away from Christ. We are to imitate God, but not be God. 
We are to imitate God, but not be God. You aren't omnipotent. You're not omniscient. You're not omnipresent. You can't be God. That's not what childlike imitation is, right? When a son imitates a father, he imitates the character of the father, but he doesn't become a father. That would be weird. A a daughter imitates her mother, imitates the character of her mother, but she doesn't automatically become a mother. She can't be. She's a daughter. That's what it means to imitate God as Christians. We imitate the character of God. We imitate things like mercy, wisdom, justice, grace, patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, Righteous indignation, truthfulness. All the things in Ephesians chapter 4 I'm listing. All the things that we were told to put on, that's imitating God. We mirror the character of God to our world and to one another. So the question then should be in your mind. How do I do that? How do I imitate God? And the answer is this, like a child does. A child looks at the one she admires, she studies that person, meditates in a way, and then after seeing the character and the behavior long enough, naturally does that. I can't put it any better than Spurgeon. This is the best quote of all time regarding meditation and imitation. Listen to Spurgeon. We are to meditate on God's word, yes. Meditation is a happy, holy, profitable engagement, and it will instruct us, strengthen us, comfort us, inspire our hearts, and make our souls steadfast. But we may not stop at meditation. We must go on to imitation of the character of God. Listen to this. We must not be satisfied with the feeding of our souls by meditation, but rise up from the banquet, from the buffet, and use the strength we've gained from the meditation. Sitting at the feet of Jesus must be succeeded by following in the footsteps of Jesus. Say that again. Sitting at the feet of Jesus must be succeeded by following in the footsteps of Jesus. So imitate God. Imitate Jesus as beloved children. Now I belabored that point, but you must understand the wildness and the wonderful reality of being a beloved child. For if you do not, you will not be able to imitate God. And that leads to the second command we have in our passage today, walk in love. Number two, walk in love. Ephesians 5, 2, we'll read that again. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. How did Christ love you? How did Christ love us? Paul uses the phrase, he gave himself up for us. Did you know that's the same phrase he used in chapter 4, verse 19, to Describe lost people. If you go to chapter 4, verse 19, look there with me. He's describing those that do not know Christ, lost, depraved people. They have become callous and have given themselves up. Same ex- I, I checked. Same exact Greek. Same exact word. Paul uses the same phrase to describe lost people as he then does to describe Christ. What's he doing with that? The phrase carries the idea that they held nothing back. Those in chapter 4, verse 19, they held nothing back from their sin and their selfishness. They gave everything of themselves over. There wasn't a drop of themselves left over to not hand over to sin. Total giving of oneself over to sin. So then in chapter 5, verse 2, it's not to sin, but for righteousness' sake. Paul uses the phrase to describe what Christ has done for you. He's delivered himself, surrendered his own rights, given all of himself to the will of the Father. For the love of those whom the Father has given him. You see here a love that holds nothing back. Nothing. A love that is selfless. And we are commanded to imitate that kind of love. To imitate Christ by walking in love like that. I mean, just think of what Christ gave up. 
what he did for sinners. The old English pastor John Gill, long time ago, he said this, Christ gave himself up. He did not give up the world and the things of it which are already his. He did not give up men, nor angels, nor animals, but he gave up himself. He gave away his time, his service, his strength, his name, fame, and reputation, all the comforts of life and even life itself in his humanity. And he did this. He didn't do this for angels, but for his chosen ones, the church. His sheep, his people, he gave himself up for them when they were sinners. He gave himself up for you, and you're to love like that. And so how does this flesh itself out in your life? If you just go back a few verses, look at verse 32 and chapter 4. How does this love flesh itself out? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. He forgave you when you were his enemy. He was and still is kind to you when you don't deserve it. He could have summoned legions of angels when he hung on the cross to get him down, to wipe out everyone. He didn't even need angels, but he could have. And yet he hung on a cross for you. You put him there. I put him there. I was part of the reason that Christ had to bear the wrath of God. And he did that for you and me. To make us once an enemy, his child, his children. That's why Jesus looks at his disciples and explains to them how they are to even love their enemies. Do you remember that? Because his disciples should know that this was the way God treated them. And the only difference is, it's a big difference. We are to forgive enemies that are sinful like us. We've offended a holy, holy, holy God. And yet he has set his love upon the elect nonetheless. How then can we, a person who is not a thrice holy God, look at an enemy, much less a church member here, and insist on not imitating the love of God by doing good to them. Because our Father in heaven is merciful to us, how can husbands look at their wives and not be more lovingly patient and caring? How can wives not look at their husbands and be more lovingly supportive and respectful? How can children who know Christ not look at their parents and even when they don't understand why they have to mow the lawn, why they got to make the bed it's because of Christ not lovingly obey how can men and women in Christ not display care and warmth towards their employer even when they absolutely disagree with them because of Christ how can a brother and sister in this church not extend forgiveness and affection toward each other and not insist on their own preferences even when they really annoy each other because of what Christ has done for them. Be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. How can I do any of that when God has presented you spotless as God's own beloved child when you were his enemy? What, what I just listed there was Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6. I just went through the list of the rest of the things that Paul is going to ask us to do. You see, they all hinge on love. Benjamin Merkel puts it this way. Love is the most important of all virtues because when it's consistently displayed, all of the other virtues will be embraced. When Christians love each other, they'll be careful to speak kindly to each other. When Christians love one another, they'll not be bitter and angry and wrathful or malicious towards one another but instead will be willing to work, willing to share with those in need. So this is love, friends. It's patient, kind, right? It does not boast, does not envy. It's not arrogant, not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. 
It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's love. So walk this way. Walk in love. Our passage this morning ends with the phrase describing Christ's sacrifice. It was a fragrant offering. Sacrifice to God. Children, if you're in this room, and you are, I need you to listen to this just one part. Children, I'm serious. I need you to listen. You have been in a kitchen, I'm sure, and you have smelled the sweet smells when mommy or daddy makes something mm -mm good in that oven, haven't you? You know when mom makes those chocolate chip cookies, she puts them in the oven, <laughs> kind of, you perk up a little bit, you go, whoa, that might be cookies, and you just get excited. It pleases you. Do you know why it pleases you when mom and dad make those sweet treats like that? Why does the smell please you? You haven't even tasted it yet, and yet you're excited about eating it. Because you know the smell has told you all that you need to know. Oh, oh it's going to be mighty good. Right? You've been there. You've been there. Did you know that's the exact same thing that Jesus Christ has done for you? Did you know that his life was so perfect, so sweet, so pure, that when he died on the cross, Jesus was pleased. He was so happy. He was more happy than you are when you smell those cookies. He's more satisfied in the life of Jesus than you are when you smell that. So next time that you're cooking, or you see your mom and dad cooking, you smell those smells again, I want you to sit down. You ask your mom and dad, tell me a little bit more about how God was satisfied and pleased because of Jesus. More satisfied than even I am in my excitement because of his smell. Next time you smell those cookies, you ask them, how was Jesus more satisfying to God than even a chocolate chip cookie can be satisfying to you? Well, just this week, my daughter Abigail, for the first time in her life, said I love you to me. And I have brought tears to my eyes, and when she said it, um, she came over to me and she flung her arms around me and it, I just held her and she rested in my arms. She just, what a picture of loving trust, uh, security, uh, and, and even more, just dependence, right? And just love you, Daddy. And, and friends, I, I don't want you to leave here this morning thinking, I just got to try harder to love. So Pastor Brown say it. I just need to buckle in, strap down. I need to try harder to imitate God. No. Do not hear me say be more moral. I want you to leave here not saying I got to try harder. I want you to leave here saying, not saying, Wrapping your, your arms around Jesus like Abigail ran and wrapped her arms around me. I love you. And I need you. Wrap your, wrap your arms around him in faith. Trust him. Depend on him. Rest in him. You cannot imitate God. You cannot walk in love apart from his supernatural work in your life. And the book of Ephesians says that if you belong to God as his child... He is supernaturally at work in you. The Holy Spirit is there. The Spirit of God won't let you go. And so, depend on Him. Trust Him. Rest in Him. Leave here clinging to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken. God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, will be because of Christ, for Christ alone. Look to Christ for this. Serve in his power and the strength that he supplies. And you will walk with him and you will walk in love.
Let's pray. Father, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus, to take him at his word, to rest upon his promises, to know thus saith the Lord. Oh, Father, we trust you. Oh, Christ, we trust you. You have proved yourself over and over in our lives. Lord, out of an abundance of words that I have just shared, may it not be lost that you loved us and gave yourself for us, a propitiation for our sins when we were enemies of God. You in eternity past, Father, knowing, knowing all of this, declared it to be so, and you call us beloved. Oh, we are thankful. Cause us to live in light of this glorious and marvelous reality. In our Savior's name, we hope and trust. Amen. Well, as, as you guys come up and sing...